morning. Good morning. First, let me thank all of you for coming out on such a beautiful morning, given the last few days. We've been out doing a lot of things, so thank you so much. I want to thank Mayor Casper so much for your introduction, but also for your service and for your leadership. It's a great community. I do look forward, after November, to really moving forward with your overall agenda here in San Miguel. And San Miguel is really a very exciting town, city. It's part of a region that's very exciting, very progressive. And it's going to be very uh, interesting, but very exciting and very, I think, inspirational to represent a new, newer part of now would be the 13th Assembly District, uh, th excuse me, 13th Congressional District, once uh, November and the elections. <laughs> and we get our votes out to the polls are completed. So thank you again very much. Also, to Tim, where, where is Tim? I just want to thank you for opening this beautiful coffee. I've been here many times and I love it. It's a wonderful place to gather. And I really appreciate uh, allowing all of each of the San Leandro residents to come to, and for being so accessible for us. Thank you. Again. Let me just uh, briefly tell you a little bit about myself. And, and I want to start with a story. I shared this with the mayor earlier. My mother is uh, 87 years old. I have a 91 year old aunt. I have a 100 year old aunt just died a couple of weeks ago. So a lot of my time. I spent the senior citizens when I was off at hospitals, emergency rooms, you know, all of the issues that we all have to do. So part of what I believe, you know, as part of my agenda overall, of course, is education, but of course, is preserving Medicare and Social Security and making sure that our seniors have the quality of life they so deserve. So my mother, hangs with me quite a bit. And I told her I was going to San Leandro this morning. It's a bit early. John Gooding knows my mother, Mildred Mask. And my mother said to me, she says, well, let me remind you of what I told you about San Leandro many years ago. I said, what? She said, when you were a little girl, this is an example of how communities evolve and an example of why I really love San Leandro. She says, when you were a little girl, I really wanted to live in San Leandro. She said, I wanted to buy a house in San Leandro. She said, and Folks told me, forget it. It's the color of my skin. She said, there's no way you can buy a house in San Diego. My mother said, well, my husband is in the military. He's stationed in my ring. Why do I not buy a house? I have two little girls. I want to live in San Leandro. So she pushed the envelope, as my mother does. And uh, she found a realtor. She said, look, they're telling me that I could buy a house in San Leandro. I really want to raise my children in San Leandro. Well, at least we can take you down. And the realtor told her, the realtor told her, forget it, don't even try. You know, I don't want you to be embarrassed, and I don't want you to be angry. And so my mother, of course, at that point, realized what was going on. Fast forward to today. And she was so excited about San Leandro being put in the 13th Congressional District because she said, finally now, you know, I can hang out with you in San Leandro. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the city where I always wanted to live. <laughs> and I share that because that's an example of progress and change and, and what many of us and many of you have gone through just to have and allow for the American dream to be real for all in terms of home ownership and in terms of really living um, wherever one wants to live and not being discriminated against based on the color of their skin. So I really am very honored and pleased uh, to be able to campaign here and to get to know you and to get to learn more about the issues that you care about. And I want to be uh, there for you in terms of not only a champion for your issues, but also constituent service. I, by profession, am a social worker, psychiatric social worker. I attended Mills College and the University of California, Berkeley. I have my MS study. And 90% of my work in my district office is about advocacy and social work. We have so many people who are losing their jobs or who have lost their jobs, who need a place to stay, who need food to eat, who need help with their income tax return, or Social Security, they got lost somewhere. And, and so part of what I believe is so important as a federal representative is to be your advocate. 
with the federal government. Because I know, again, going back to my mother and my aunts, I know how bureaucracies can be. And so my staff is a wonderful staff. They're accessible 24-7. I'm accessible 24-7. And we really do pride ourselves on advocacy and constituent services. Pete Stark is my brother, my friend. He mentored me so much. He has told me so much about family and he also is a person who I know you care about deeply. And so we're going to make sure as we campaign in San Leandro and make this transition that Pete and I are there side by side. He, he well, you know Pete Stark. He is phenomenal. He speaks the truth. He's an advocate for our seniors and for health care reform. And he's an individual who we sit together on the floor and say, Pete, what do you think? How are you going to vote? Uh, I don't know. I think this is going to not be good for my community. I say, yeah, I don't think it's going to be good for my community. So sometimes we're the only two or three, maybe with George Miller, who vote in a certain way. But that's because we know that oftentimes uh, the Tea Party brings proposals to the floor which uh, could, could put us in a trick bag sometimes. And so thank God for Pete Stark. Thank God that you're able to, you've been able to have a for so many years. Of course, at the top of my agenda, <coughs> excuse me, I know the mayor's agenda, council members, economic development, job creation. This economy, we see glimmers of hope, but too many people are still unemployed. Uh, we see glimmers of hope, but too many people have lost their homes due to the foreclosure crisis. And so we have a lot of work to do. And so much of what I want to do during this campaign is listen, first of all, to what your priorities are and try to figure out strategies and ways we can move forward with your priorities. Because I know education, jobs, public transportation, all economic development, waterfront, green jobs is a very important part of what we have to do and move forward in San Diego. Finally, let me just say, as the mayor said, I am a member of the Appropriations Committee. It's a tough committee. Um, there are very few women on that committee. I think they're pro in terms of Democrats, there may be maybe six women out of the committee of about 40. And it's a committee that is very powerful and very important because we determine our federal spending priorities. I'm on the subcommittee on Labor, Health, and Human Services, which is the subcommittee that actually funds our health care reform efforts. It funds Medicare, Social Security. It funds community clinics. And of course, we have many challenges right now in terms of the priorities and where the Republicans are going. And we have to maintain our priorities on that subcommittee because schools, community clinics, the National Institute of Health, all of the major, major domestic programs come through that subcommittee. I'm also on the subcommittee on financial services and appropriations committee. And that's the subcommittee that, that funds the Small Business Administration, the Consumer Finance Agency, the Treasury Department, the IRS, all of our independent agencies which is very, very critical. And so I'm able to use my, my leverage from those subcommittees to really enhance and promote my district's agenda. Because when agencies come to your subcommittee for their budget, you really have the opportunity to ask the hard questions and to demand some answers on behalf of your constituents. And so that's part of what we do on appropriations. Finally, uh, and I know earmarks are very controversial, but let me tell you one thing. I support earmarks. And I support earmarks, and, I, and part of what I have to do is educate the public about why I support oftentimes some things that are very, that are very controversial. First of all, 99% of earmarks are transparent and are, are the right types of earmarks. The 1% of the scam artists and the, the folks who abuse the earmark process shouldn't drive the overall process. And I'm going to close by saying this. When I first was elected uh, to represent Castro Valley, Ashland, Cherry Lane, Fairview, I looked at the new parts of the district. And I said, wait a minute, what are the priorities? And in uh, Ashland and Cherry Lane, there are no sidewalks for children to walk to school. And so I had an opportunity to fight with earmarks to build sidewalks in Ashland. And I'm very proud of what we've done with earmarks. Off the fueling stations for the 
um, fuel cell bus from AC Transit. Well, you know what? The very first fuel cell bus prototype was an earmark that I got from AC Transit. And now, ear, now fuel cell technology is beginning to become a, a very, very mainstay technology in terms of energy independence and, and uh, alternative sources of fuel. So I share that with you because I'm going to fight to try to get earmarks back because I want to be able to direct more federal funding to San Leandro. I think it's important that members of Congress direct money to what they, their constituents believe are their priorities. And so, so when you hear me fighting against them when they say no, I'm going to say no, 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 no. I'm going to stand tall for my district because I want to be able to direct their tax dollars back to what their priorities are. I'll close now and just thank you again very much for coming out. I look forward to working with you and hopefully to campaigning with you. I love walking precincts. We'll be phone banking. We'll be doing all the new technology kind of campaign efforts too. But I still like the old-fashioned way of meeting people, knocking on doors, talking to people, and listening. So thank you again. She can get together the five million dollars to dredge the marina. I'm working with, with the mayor and Congressman Stark. Where there's a will, there's a way. And where I, one of the efforts, I, I really believe I have to fight every dime for my district. And so, believe you me, I'm going to fight for whatever we need. Thank you, for the <laughs> Okay, questions. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Congressman Lee. Uh, you have been a a great champion of um, anti-poverty and anti-hunger work in D.C. We hear you loud and clear in the district. Um, I wonder if you could say a couple minutes about um, the attacks that we see on anti-hunger programs, safety net programs, in the Ryan budget, um, the opportunities you've had to speak to the president directly about protection of the, of the country's most important anti-hunger program, the food stamp program known as SNAP. Um, if you could just say a second about, about that. Thank you very much for Keeping that. Keeping the anti-hunger and food stamp what program. What I do in Washington, D.C., of course, relates directly to my district uh, in terms of poverty reduction. Poverty rates are growing, growing up in this country like you would not believe uh, for many, many reasons. Uh, childhood poverty, children poverty growing up. So many people uh, during this economic downturn and recession have had to have that bridge over the troubled water, uh, a safety net. And uh, food stamps provide that safety net. The majority of people on food stamps do not want to be on food stamps. They want a job, they want to work, they want to be able to take care of their family. Just as a little bit of background on myself again, when I was a student raising two small kids as a single mom, I was on public assistance. And I thank my government for providing me the opportunity to get food stamps, because I needed that, because I didn't know what I was going to do. And so more, most people are like myself. They just need that kind of help. And so when we reauthorized the agricultural bill and the child nutrition efforts, there had been an effort to cut some money out of food stamps to fund the overall child nutrition effort. And we said, no way. I, I chaired the Congressional Black Caucus at that point for two years. And we said, no way. We're not going to allow anyone to take $2 billion out of our uh, food stamp program to fund a very good child nutrition program. So we fought that battle. And oftentimes, I have to take on my own part. And it's not, it, it's not hostile, but it's a very respectful debate we have to engage in, because that was a debate I had to engage in with my own party and said, we can't do this. And we held up the bill for it. But finally, we were able to get it resolved, and we did not allow $2 billion to be taken out of these. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What you've done in that regard, because it's something that, for those of us who have been your constituents, have just such a great support in terms of, for one week, you lived on food stamps. Oh, yes. Just well, you know, every year, or every two years, there's a food stamp challenge by the hunger groups, which is a wonderful challenge because I lead the effort on Capitol Hill to get members of Congress to live off of food stamps for a week. <laughs> <laughs> it's a challenge. That's $4.50 a day. 
And I'm going to tell you, and we blog on it, and we write about it and talk about what families go through living off that kind of a budget. First of all, you have to buy canned food, and, and I got the bent up canned food because that's cheaper. And you look at the sodium content, it's off the scale. Okay, so the health disasters and the health risks around, you know, having such little in terms of the low amount of food stamp allocations is, is tremendous. That's why we're seeing that more kids with childhood obesity. obesity. Secondly, during uh, some of my comedians, for example, the concentration of, you know, you're always thinking about food. Where am I going to get my next meal? I only have a dollar and fifty left. So I'm sitting up at 11 o'clock thinking, how am I going to eat the rest of the day when I should think about something else? But I'm thinking about food for $1.50. And, and so the young people, you know, have a very hard time concentrating if they're hungry. And, and so, you know, nutrition is extremely important just for brain development and for concentration. Uh, thirdly, you know, when I got to the end of the week, I was here and I only had maybe a couple of dollars left and I had two more days. And so I started looking for the food pantries, you know, start calling around. And I'm finding the lines are getting longer, you know, uh, people, because of the economy, you know, the contributions aren't as great. You know, you've got to go all over town just to find a meal. And so we have to really enhance the emergency food supply and food pantries because people really do have a hard time when they get close to uh, running out of their food stamp allocation, which the whole purpose is to try to increase the dollar amount uh, for food stamps. But there's some serious health risks, you know, in terms of not being able to eat nutritious food when you're low income and when you don't have access to the kind of um, food that you should be eating to lead a, a healthy life. So we do this every couple of years. I usually end up with nine or ten members of Congress, and uh, believe you me, by the end of the week, you know, we're we're thinking about all the I think about all the people who don't get off at the end of the week. They're still on this. You know, I had the chance, I remember it was on Tuesday, I had the chance to stop on, on the Tuesday, but, you know, I'm thinking of all the people who don't have that opportunity to stop. And that's part of the, the, one of the issues that I've changed in times. Uh, sir, uh, good morning, thank you for coming. My name is Charles Gonzalez and I'm with the National Association of Letter Carriers. And just to touch on what you just said, next month, May 12th, the second Saturday in May, we hold our uh, annual food drive. Let it carry food drive and we pick up food at every residence that we stop on. And what I'd like to speak to you about is a bill that's currently in the Senate. I know you're in the House, but it has some uh, provisions in it that will dismantle the postal service. It wants to eliminate Saturday delivery, which is the day that we pick up the food for the letter carrier drive, and it will eliminate door to door delivery. I know a lot of times a lot of seniors depend on their medications to be delivered. A lot of them are homebound. And we do a neighborhood watch. There are individuals who need our attention. They can't get outside and they need our help. And uh, what I'd like to talk to you about is they want to close the processing plants, 250 of them. They want to close 3,700 post offices nationwide and eliminate the standard for delivering first class mail. I know that it's going to affect seniors a lot. My mother lives on the rural route, and I know that your grandfather was a letter carrier in Texas, and he got his pension check in the mail. So if they eliminate door-to-door -door delivery, it will affect our food drive and it will affect those seniors that are homebound. So when that legislation does go through the Senate and reach the uh, House floor, we need to make sure that these provisions that will dismantle and damage the Postal Service and 80,000 jobs are taken out of that provision. Can you kind of speak well, on that? Well, let me tell you, I'm totally opposed to that bill, first of all. Thank you. Secondly, uh, as a member, again, of the Appropriations Committee, the uh, Postal Service comes under the Financial Services Subcommittee, so we have a chance to weigh in on that. It may not be that, that bill because it's an authorization, but on the budget. Uh, thirdly, I mentioned I was the uh, former chair of the Black Caucus, but I also co-chair the Progressive Caucus, and we have formed what we call Quad Caucus, Progressive, Black, Hispanic, and Latino Caucus, so that's a lot of votes. So I will be sure that we, you know, not allow those uh, provisions to go through. But we've got to remember we have a Tea Party led Congress, so we don't have the numbers to win almost anything on the floor, as you have seen, because of the structuralist nature of what we do, you know, of those 70 some Tea Party members. So we're going to fight and try to make this right. 
Second, let me also say that we've been fighting with the Postal Service to keep post offices open in my district, and we've been successful in keeping several open. I mean, they wanted to shut down post offices uh, in low-income communities. Of course, we had to fight that. Uh, even now, there's Saturday service, and I, I went to one post office personally for my mother, and I said, why is this post office closed? It was a Saturday. I went to another one in a different part of town, it was open. And so you know I'm raising pain about that. <laughs> yeah, so there's got to be some equity, you know, and some justice in all of this. My grandfather was a letter carrier. Now, he, I was born and raised in El Paso, Texas. He was the first African-American letter carrier in El Paso. He had his degree from uh, Austin Tillotson College, and he spoke fluent Spanish. And uh, I remember pictures seeing him uh, delivering mail on horseback. <laughs> I was around that, but, <laughs> but he delivered mail on horseback. But when he were at, and I can remember very vividly, though, waiting for that mail delivery for his retirement check. Going out there, getting it from the letter carrier, and bringing it in once my grandfather retired. And that little $200,000 month then really did help to take care of our family. So I am totally committed to the Postal Service and to letter carriers and to making sure that uh, they do not do what they do. What a, lot, what a lot of people don't understand too is that over 25% of the employees that are employed by the Postal Service right now are military veterans, myself included. And if they were able to eliminate those jobs, it would affect veterans and the elderly. Yep. So yep. we need to make sure that we keep Thank the Thank you for raising that. We're going to mount a major campaign. Other questions? Yes. I want to add on to that. Another thing I worry about by the post office is our absentee ballots. And I feel like it can impact our election process when we don't get our ballots. Yeah, that's right. It's going to impact a heck of a lot that we don't even realize is going to impact right now. The unintended. I guess unintended consequences will be really very damaging to uh, veterans and to low income individuals, to seniors, to communities. Okay. Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned your support for education. What is your position on reach for the top? Our perception is that that is not going to benefit education as an overall. It tends to move public education back more toward private or our perception of private. And it doesn't really support the public education, which is what all of us are going to depend on more and more as we get older and retire. I, as I said, I'm on this subcommittee that funds race to the top, and I haven't been that impressed, quite frankly. I, I want to see, and, and I believe that we're moving toward more uh, private voucher education, and I, and I want to see our public education strengthened. I, I really, quite frankly, don't think leave no, uh, no child left behind, leave no child behind was a very good uh, policy. And so I think we need to go back to the drawing board, try to reform that policy, and also look at how we're beginning to privatize these schools. So I am not a big fan of Race to the Top. But, you know, Secretary Duncan has been to my district several times. We've talked, and we're trying to figure out a way to, at least while they have it, and it's going to be there, how we can make it more public education. Okay, but I'm a strong supporter of public education. I'm going to walk up here, since we're filming this, I'd be behind the camera. Pleased to meet you. My name is Mia Housley. And I actually wrote you about 12 years ago when I thought you represented me. I was so excited to be represented by Barbara Lee, and you wrote back and said, no. <laughs> but now I'm so glad, as Tim says, to finally have Barbara Lee speak for me. But um, I, I wrote this down. I don't want to sound arrogant, but I want to be fair. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, San Leandro is not really different from Oakland or Berkeley. We're middle class, working class, impoverished people. We're, we're losing our homes. We need to find decent paying work. Um, you know, but for decades, we've actually been like a, you know, a big fish in a small pond. And there's many of us now who are, you know, we feel worried as we're changing that. San Leandro is going to get ignored and our needs, which, you know, we have some needs that may be different, but we'll get ignored over your former constituents of the new birth. So, you know, two questions, I guess, or the one question that comes from that is, how can we help you understand what our needs are and feel that we're going to be taken care of? Um, and can I answer that first? Okay. That's why I'm here, first of all. <laughs> records of 
myself because I have, Oakland and Berkeley will remain in the 13th district, but I also have Albany, Emeryville, Piedmont, Castro Valley, Ashland, Sherryland, and Fairfield. And I don't believe, for 10 years I've had that part of the district, I don't believe that uh, they felt left out. And whenever I see a need in those parts of the district, I've been very strong for them. Office hours in parts of the district that are away from Oakland, they know when my staff's going to be there to conduct the case for it. I've worked with earmarks, have gotten earmarks for the parts of the district that are not in Oakland and in Berkeley. And I really consider my, now, my current ninth congressional district a ninth congressional district. It's not Oakland, Berkeley, Emeryville. This is the ninth congressional district. If Emeryville has issues that they want me to address uh, as an appropriator, I will address that as an appropriator. So I want to get to know more about what the issues are, but trust me, <laughs> this will be part of the 13th congressional district. Oh, well, thank you. And then, so here comes a major issue that we have here. Um, you're probably aware of San Leandro Hospital's struggle with Sutter in a kind of a blatant demonstration of medical redlining. Sutter has been trying to close the hospital, its emergency room and other acute care services. Um, the Coalition to Save San Leandro Hospital has kept it open for about two and a half years past Sutter's deadline, which was October of 2009. But we're losing the legal battle. Um, the state Supreme Court just refused to hear our appeal. So, it, you know, we don't have a lot of hope that way. However, you know, our emergency room sees 27,000 people a year. You know, 14,000 of them need acute care only. They have to have the emergency room. You know, another thousand are so critical that they would likely die if they were transferred. You know, if that hospital closes down, you know, there's half of those people, 14,000 of them, they're going to flood even the Highland Hospital, which is already overpopulated. Sutter wants to close down our hospital in 90 days. We don't, you know, we're not seeing a lot of hope legally, so maybe you could talk to how, what can you do to help us in this battle politically? Well, first I... To keep our acute yeah, care services. Well, I, I, I do know that your supervisor Wilma Chan and others are really working very hard yes. uh, to try to keep this hospital open, and especially for this I will work with them to do whatever, because I know Sutter very well, and, and I know what you're talking about, and I don't want to see the hospital closed, nor do I want to see the emergency closed. So whatever strategy or political strategy that a federal representative can go in on, I'm there. Okay, But I don't know in terms of what Congress can start has moved forward with, I will talk to them and join with them. that was missing from your introduction was your stand on war. And one of the things I really respect you for and one of the reasons you're my hero is because of your stand on the Iraq-Afghanistan wars. And we have Republicans... No, sir, you were not the first. Mm -hmm. right. uh, we have uh, Republicans who are talking about war with Iran. We've had a couple of candidates who say, I will not put up with a communist dictatorship 40, 80 miles off the coast of Cuba. Uh, so we really need strong uh, anti-war voices. Uh, being a, a retired teacher of 35 years, doing substitute uh, special day classes, special ed classes in three districts, the most harmful thing to children right now in schools is nickel bean. The whole thing of uh, money and uh, all this basic test scores, and you go in the classrooms now, there's a te state tests are coming up now, and the kids are just being drilled. They're being drilled. They're being drilled. They're being drilled. They're, being drilled. They're, being, they're not really learning. Uh, you know, so uh, I would like to ask you to post any legislation that uses test scores as, as yeah. some kind of way to judge the finance uh, public school. I don't like to because it requires In 1977, <laughs> I was doing political work on the Dawson Park, 
in Atlanta and southern Georgia. And I went to enroll my daughter in the public schools in Georgia. Uh -uh. They had charter schools, they had academies that were all white. The public schools were all black. And that I, I see as a real possibility of charter schools and, and privatization of, uh, of education. So I think education issues are key to our future. And thank you. It is. And thank you very much. For it. I mentioned earlier my dad was in the military. I come from a military family. 25 years, my father was his lieutenant colonel in the army. And we've been through a couple of wars, my family. And I know we need to First of all, our veterans have done a tremendous job. And anything I can do to support our veterans as they make their transition home, we have to do. Because they have done everything this country has asked them to do. And now we have to do everything that they need. And that includes looking out for their economic security, their health care, their mental health care, the suicide rates are on the right, it's, it's horrendous. On Afghanistan, no, I didn't vote for that resolution. That was a very terrible moment after, you know, we lost 30 some hundred people. And actually my former chief of staff's uh, cousin was a flight attendant on Flight 93. So you can imagine what my office was going through during that period. And, and I was on the Foreign Affairs Committee, been on that committee for about 10 years, and they brought a resolution forward that said, three days after this horrific event, that said the president, any president, can use force in perpetuity against any nation, organization, individual he or she deems connected to 9-11. I mean, this was a blank check to go to war against forever. And that's how, and I could not vote for that. That was not trying to get us out now. And so I hope that you all will kind of follow because Congressman Stark is on all of my bills and we're saying no more funding for combat operation, only money to protect our troops and contractors and to bring them home in an orderly way. Secondly, on Iran, let me tell you. First of all, the U.S. has a no-contact policy with Iran. And so there's no policy that allows for diplomatic, uh, bilateral diplomatic relations. And secondly, I, I see that the diplomatic option is being taken off of the table where there will only be a military option. And so I introduced the legislation, and it's picking up quite a bit of support, including Congressman Stark, that says the U.S. has got to engage in a major diplomatic initiative with Iran to reduce the threat of nuclear weapons, because none of us want to see Iran or any country. We can get rid of our own arsenal in, here in America. So, you know, so non-proliferation is part of my work. Nuclear weapons can destroy the world. And, and so we need to have the tensions reduced, we need a strong diplomatic option, and we need to get rid of this no-contact policy with Iran. And so this bill does that. And, and if, once again, Congressman Stark is supportive, but if any of you have friends around the country who can tell their members to get on it, please do, because it's really not quite a bit. Other questions? questions? Uh, yes. How many laws have you made and how many laws has the president signed and How many laws? Wow. <laughs> authored many, many laws. Now, I've got to tell you, since the Tea Party has come into power two years ago, most Democrats don't get too many laws passed. <laughs> but even when President Bush was in office, the Republican president, he signed most of my laws, and especially as it relates to HIV and AIDS. You know, HIV and AIDS is a very serious problem. And all of, the, all of my bills on HIV and AIDS including getting rid of a travel ban, which was in place, President Bush or President Obama signed into law. And so many of my amendments, the process also is we have amendments that get into legislation. So I've got many amendments into legislation that the President has signed into law. And I'll give you just one example. In terms of uh, genetically based foods for school children, well, I want parents to at least know 
that these some of this food is genetically modified food. And so I got an amendment into one of the nutrition bills several years ago that said parents and students have a right to know if they're being fed genetically modified food. And so that was signed in. Um, I had a question around um, women's right to choose to do, uh, access to contraception. So obviously in California, I don't think that's an issue, at least right now. But it's obviously an issue in the states outside of California, a lot of states outside of California. So I'm wondering what you're doing as part of your um, appropriations committee to work with your colleagues in the Congress to ensure that women have the right to choose and women have the right to contraception. Sure, and I believe this is, I, I, there is a war on women, believe me, regardless of what we're going to say. And since I've been in Congress, I have seen more amendments come through, and the Appropriations Committee is where the fight takes place, because they try to write in legislation that would, in essence, get rid of Roe versus Wade, which would affect women in California. We have to fight against that. They tried to defund Planned Parenthood. We fought against that. One of the issues now, unfortunately, is that women in the District of Columbia only, which are primarily minority women, don't have access to their own funds or their own, you know, the private funds, access to uh, abortion rights, which is terrible. And we're trying to reverse that. I had every member of, uh, of every African American woman of the Black Caucus write to our senators to tell them that when this bill gets over here, please don't let them do this to the District of Columbia, because oftentimes people forget that there are people who may not have a vote, but these people deserve, these women deserve the same access that we have. And so what I see taking place now is every step of the way, they're trying to get rid of contraception, they're trying to get rid of Planned Parenthood, they're trying to defund every women's health care program and initiative that uh, we have established over the years. It's, it's unbelievable what they're trying to do. And uh, they're trying to take us way back to those days. That, And many young women think it always was this way. And I remember, you remember maybe the days that uh, back alley abortions, you remember when contraceptives weren't available. And so we cannot allow uh, women's rights and women's health care to be eroded. I'm working very hard each and every day to try to, first of all, stop these efforts in the appropriations but also to move forward and try to get some rational policies. Teen pregnancy, for example, comprehensive sex education. Do you know that under the welfare reform bill, abstinence only was the only type of program that federal funding could be used for? Now, with the high incidence of our teens with sexual transmitted infections, HIV and AIDS, we need comprehensive sex education. Fortunately, California denied federal funding, so I have legislation we work through approach to get most of that policy lifted. Where now, if you want to teach comprehensive sex education to young people, you can receive federal funding for that. But up until a couple of years ago, that was not the case. And so this is a battle, this is a war, and we've got to win it because women uh, deserve equal justice. They deserve to, uh, you know, they deserve adequate health care, appropriate health care. And they should be the ones to decide what they want to do with their lives. Finally, let me just say I'm very concerned about the influence of religion right now in politics and in policy. I'm a person of faith, and I, do, I, I believe in the separation of church and state. Very, very seriously. Very seriously. And I see this being eroded each and every day. This is not a theocracy, my brothers. It's, it's really not. This is a democracy. And so we should not allow religion to drive public policy and it's very scary. Yeah, when Barack Obama gets reelected uh, this November, uh, do, you, do you think that the cap on Social Security during the second term will be lifted so that everybody pays the same percentage and it'll be fully funded to almost the end of the century, according to Bernie Sanders, anyway. <laughs> it's going to be fully funded. We have to, you know, they're playing all kinds of games right now with Medicare. But we, we have to keep Medicare as we know it. 
okay, whether the cap is lifted, whatever. There's enough money in the trust fund, the Social Security trust fund. We have enough resources with Medicare. You know, we may have to fix some of the bureaucratic and administrative problems. Yeah. But we should not allow even a discussion about privatizing Medicare, which is, or voucherizing Medicare, which is what we debate right now is about. Hopefully, you will help us re-elect President Barack Obama because he's done a phenomenal job with, right. and especially with the hand that he was dealt with <laughs> after coming out of the Bush administration. And I think we're going to see uh, some very bold moves on behalf of the president. Right now, we're seeing the president and the Congress, at least the Democrats, maintain Medicare uh, and fighting against these changes that they're trying to make. But we can't lose the House and we can't lose the presidency because if we do everything that we can fight the force all over. So please help us on all fronts. been such a shot in the arm for us because we don't get the kind of response as a uh, discretionary program for a lot when we visit the other city. It helps us come back and speak to the population we serve with so much more confidence knowing that you know we've had uh, your vote on all these key issues. So thank you for the work you've done on uh, health and human services and nutrition and transportation and all of that and I hope that going forward until November some of these issues that we are fighting with uh, like the lady said e e contraception but also equal pay for equal work and tax reforms and things affect all your constituents but also women who form such a big part of the so I hope you'll use your platform through your newsletters to keep these issues on the radar because it's it, these are grim sure. times. Thank you very much for that because we have to, just because we can't some, get something passed doesn't mean the debate shouldn't go on. We need to use this moment to really educate people, develop broader coalitions, help people know what the facts are, what the politics are, and be ready for November. And so that's what we try to do. So thank you very much for that because it's really important to, right now on the ground especially because people feel down. I, everywhere I go, people feel a bit frustrated, uh, 
dejected, they're scared, they're angry. I mean, there's a, throughout the country, a real sense of who are we as a country? You know, what are our values? Where are we going from here? And so I think part of what we have to do in this area is to continue to do what you're doing. And we certainly will continue to send our the word out, because I like to alert people when I see something coming down the pipe, I let my constituents know and get on this pretty quick before it's too late. And so we'll continue to do that, but thank you. And last question, yes sir. Um, I was wondering what your take is on uh, growing inequality that's taking place in our country. Um, two dimensions of it that, that I've been interested in lately is one, corporate governance. You know, we all know that the CEOs make 400 times what the average worker is making, but not too many people are talking about how it's done. And Dean Baker talks about this. He says that it's the quid pro, pro quo between the CEOs and the board members. The CEOs get their 10 million a year in exchange for gigs where the board members show up for six meetings a year and get two or three hundred thousand a year. So that's one thing, and I was wondering, um, can Congress really do anything about this? The other is that a big proud part of the inequality stems from what I think is quality education in that country. In Europe right now, they have 10 times as many people, young people, working class people, going to apprenticeship programs than the United States. And, and that's where people have got to pick up skills to make decent living. It seems like that should be more of an emphasis than you know, the charter schools and the race to the top. If we could somehow focus on much more apprenticeships. The, over 50% of the kids in Europe um, under 22 are in apprenticeship. We're at 4% here. Yeah, and you're absolutely correct. And that, again, as an appropriator, and looking at the president's budget and what the Progressive Caucus, we have the budget and the Black Caucus, we boost apprenticeship training programs like you would not believe. Also, and I think you heard in the President's State of the Union, his position on community colleges, because much of our apprenticeship program, vocational training, goes through community colleges. So there's a real effort to boost funding and focus for apprenticeship training, vocational education. You're absolutely correct. Everywhere in the world, young people are getting skills and they're getting their jobs for the real jobs that are out there. Secondly, on income inequality, you know, I formed several years ago, this was when President Bush was in office, the Out of Poverty Caucus, because I knew then, I saw his economic policies and what they were doing in terms of increasing poverty rates and growing inequality. Part of what um, has happened is the, the CEO compensation, this has, been, this has been totally off the scale in terms of being a, a huge factor in income inequality. I, and there's legislation, we can't, move this legislation again for reasons I mentioned earlier, but there's several uh, bills that we're working on, that I'm working on, and others who try to begin to address this. And let me just give you an example of one of my bills. And this is specifically on uh, CEO compensation. I don't believe that a CEO should be paid any more than 25 times what the lowest wage worker pays is paid and get a federal income tax deduction. In other words, we're subsidizing their pay. And so all I'm saying is you can pay your CEO whatever you want, but the taxpayer is not going to subsidize. You know, right now, we're subsidizing the taxpayer. Thank you. 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 You know, we're going to continue to see, unfortunately, poverty rates grow. I mean, that's what the 99% is really all about. And we haven't had, really, a people willing to step forward and talk about the 99% and to talk about income inequality until very recently. And so keep it up, keep the push up, because this has got to be one of the top issues of the time.